I have a couple short stories, but I'm going to open with Hipster Haiku. Ooh. It's my downtown shit. <laughs> Old shit. Ever the ghosts are heading downtown to CB's to hear the Ramones. Sunny St. Mark's Place. For sale, cheap jewelry shines. The CD's melting. The poets write home. There is no place quite like it. I wear a beret. <laughs> Edie Youth quaked. I saw her on the rhino. In vogue, I was three. New York and jams. Nothing like a backup band with poetry man. <laughs> Where's my saddlebag? I must grab my bike and go to the record store. Hey, vinyl, vinyl, here's a banana for you. Pull my zipper down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is called Jump. After some time goes by, you begin to see your life's through lines. Though these lines are wiggly waggly, certainly not the shortest distance between two points, we can look back and see, well, how we got here. Whether free falling, then bobbing on a bungee, or chasing a rickety wild mouse rail, one foot on the platform and the other on the train, we can turn around a score later and lap dissolve. Time reveals the stump dotted path we took through our personal woods to reach the clearing. And our waggly through lines have soundtracks. I consider the song Jump such a sonic touchstone. This tune hit top 10 radio in the summer of 1984, which was also the name of Van Halen's record on which it appeared. Jump met me on my twisty path, and it morphed from egging anthem to black comedic theme song and back again. That summer, I met and heavily crushed on a baseball player. As I contemplated the delicate matter of losing my virginity to this fellow, <clears throat> David Lee Roth would ring from the radio. Might as well jump. So I did. Jump took on a second life when I had the abortion. I lost my heart and my mind. My soul, let's not go there. Might as well jump, yeah, right off a roof. Here, the musical exhortation, which had been a secret cherry-busting message from Mr. Just a Gigolo himself to little old Ronnie, now had me thinking Walt Whitman, the bridge, not the poet. Around that time, I did walk across the jumper's favorite, Golden Gate. I was unhappy, but damn, that was high up. <laughs> and in retrospect, I am being a little dramatic. I never really considered jumping from a bridge, but that song. A few years later, I landed in Los Angeles, smack in the middle of art madman John Pope in a zero-one gallery whirlwind. I gradually learned the history of John's punky scene, including his early sponsorship by X and DLR. Mr. Jump couldn't have been nicer when we visited him at his home in Pasadena to pick up a stage cape for Michael Petrie's Hollywood Portraits show. Another song in that 1984 record sprang to life in the character of Top Jimmy. David Lee got that one right, too. Top Jimmy, he's the king. He really knows how to swing. Top Jimmy, he know, he's no clown. He really brings the house down. Top Jimmy. Top Jimmy was a real person. James Konchak Jr., the grittiest blues belter in Hollywood, who with his rhythm pigs had opened for Tom Waits Monday nights at the Cafe de Grand for years. Jimmy got his nickname back when he worked at Top Taco and used to pass out freebies to his broke punk pals. <laughs> I think I would have loved Jimmy even if I hadn't been shrooming when I met him. <laughs> and he severed his right pinky when he stabbed the pizza box with the serrated steak knife. And I had to play Clara Barton for him because there were no other chicks around. And I hate blood. <clears throat> you could say we bonded. One night when we were partying at John's, redundant phrase, I vaguely heard the phone ringing over fire hose and the intellectual blather. I went in the bedroom and waited until the greeting message ran out to see who was calling which was John's house policy. John, John, the phone rang out. It's Janie, please pick up. This Janie girl was distressed with a capital D. I didn't know Janie, but I picked up the phone. Hello, Janie, this is John's um, girlfriend, Ronnie. Let me, thank God you picked up. Please get John. She was hysterical. Tara was my best friend. She's gone. I was afraid to put the phone down. I'm so sorry, Janie, what happened? She jumped from the Roosevelt Hotel. I wasn't expecting that bomb. Oh, well, sorry. Oh, God. 
This was more than cringeworthy. Tara was one of John's exes. He had made a vague reference to her a week earlier. My crazy old girlfriend Tara called last night at 3 a.m. 3 a.m. was not actually late for John. That was usually about the time we would get in from Raji's after the usual suspects were rounded up for another and followed us up the hill to the, Chelsea, the Chateau Le Fleur. She wanted to see me, but I told her, no, I have a girlfriend. Tara, crazy Tara had jumped. <sighs> Janie and I ended up good friends after I fielded her call. In that moment, I provided her a sounding board, which John perhaps could not have, and she provided me a cautionary tale in my early goings with JP. Over time, I grew to understand Tara's desperation for John's attention, but instead of jumping, I danced. One night, WWWP at Jay's, that's while we were partying at John's, <clears throat> Top Jimmy asked me and Miss Jillian to dance with him and the Rhythm Pigs for a few reunion shows around town. We thought this sounded like fun. Might as well jump. Jimmy took us to Playmates on Hollywood Boulevard and bought us fringe skirts. They really work well. And crisscross tank tops, which we packed, repaired, excuse me, with cowboy boots, and we were ready to rock. We rated either a tasty side dish to Jimmy's Thanksgiving feast or gratuitous and offensive, depending on whether you su subscribe to Rock City News or The Hollywood Reporter. <laughs> Thank you, Ethelian Vare. We will never forget your name. <clears throat> Time jumps, Jimmy walks me and Jill into the Slick China Club, and we're invited on stage. The Hollywood gods were crazy. Jill and I went from top Jimmy's sidekicks to China Club dolls at the old cafe locale, which address still showed on Jimmy's driver's license. He used to sleep in the basement after the weights gigs. Polkner remained unimpressed, even as we girls found ourselves on stage with new rock gods week after week. <laughs> All right, thanks. All right, and this is a Philly. This is a Philly story for Phil. Phil. Okay, it's a little longer. Back home, the hardest thing about the worst stories is that while you're writing them down, you feel the need to run and take a shower, ignore them, stuff them into the back of the closet behind those other rattling bones, and tune out the words, even as you type them. Shane Halligan shot himself in front of the library inside Springfield High School, my high school, yesterday. He was 16, son of John, John the son of Mrs. Halligan, the lady township bus driver we've known all our lives. Mrs. Halligan, the grandmother. Is she still driving the buses? Michael D. Laurentis Jr. was quoted in the Inquirer online and then below his dad, our pal D'Lo, explaining that Shane was a good kid from a hardworking family. We know a lot of the Halligans. They have the pub on Bethlehem Pike after all. And their Michael was Aaron, Michael Delo's classmate, uncle of Shane. Poor Shane and poor family and poor hometown Springfield. How far have our grades slipped when a good kid from a hardworking family resorts to his dad's AK-47 to deal with what? Is grade slipping? That seems too much a non-answer. By all reports, Shane was well-liked, yet bullied at times, and therefore stuck up for other kids who were bullied. Funny, one of the apparent bullies checked in on Shane's MySpace page, RIP, something about not realizing how his kidding around could affect people. If bully parents create bully children, what kind of parents create a kid who will grab a gun when his grades slip? How culpable are we all? What might my great kid do if he gets angry or sad enough the questions swirl in the sadness of the hometown tragedy. Then I went home for the holidays. That happened in December. And this is six, 2006 into 2007. So I saw a bunch of friends Saturday night. Met JB and Mares and the kids for dinner at the Shanachie Ambler, then drove down the pike and up the hill and met Phil Goldie at McNally's where Billy Hill was on the grill. There was a lot of rhyming going on. I got to McNally's about 9.15 after parking on the side street, feeling fairly certain I was on the right block but not having spotted the green door before turning off Germantown Avenue. Billy came out from behind the grill to greet me with a big hug, and we caught up a few minutes. Seems we both look exactly the same. <laughs> he insisted on introducing me to his friend, Coach K, who was on his way out. This is my friend, Mary Veronica. I said, hi, I'm Ronnie Norpel. Coach K says, Vince? I smiled. Of course, Vince, my little brother. So Coach K and I catch up a sec. He had seen Vinny a few weeks earlier at his son Brendan's induction into the CHA Hall of Fame. Billy throws in, I used to work for the Phillies. 
Coach K splits, and I immediately harass Billy. Come on, Billy, you should know you can't do that with me around here. What did you think? He wouldn't have known at least someone in my family. We laugh because he knows I'm kidding, but he also knows I'm right. I'm all mobbed up down there, I swear. It's like, okay. <clears throat> Nonetheless, he introduces me to Craig, the bartender, has a steak, no, not steak, in the Schmitter's stand at the Citizens Bank ballpark and told me about its origination. Gary Maddox was somehow involved in getting the McNally sisters in as minority business owners when some other concessionaire backed out of the deal. I didn't bother telling Craig we were friends. Never mind, but I grinned inside. The madman rules. I wondered where Phil was. He's usually mil militarily timely. Then he walked in in his flight jacket, big grin, nice new specs. El Ronica, you said nine-ish, and I always give chicks at least an extra 15 minutes. <laughs> I introduced Phil and Billy, all's well. I had explained to Billy that Phil was the original sponsor of the Dead Hour on WXPN. Nothing more needed to be said. Plus, they're both huge Phillies fans, though Phil largely disavowed them in conversation. He's just jaundiced like the rest of us, but as surely as he, we, he will don his team jersey when they start doing it this season. Phil is not a rabbi, but he plays one on TV, or more accurately, has to take direction from a Harvard trained one who would better do so himself. But at least the Jewesses are, well, they're not actually treating him right. They're panically throwing them naked selves at him in some sort of Jap illusion that is the optimal approach with a nice boy like Phil when your mother is up your p-word about where's her grandbaby. P and I agreed that in our advanced age, ha, we were more interested in companionship than any sexual conquistador or playing one on TV. Politics was bound to arise, and I wasn't surprised when Goldie laid his specter ghost story on me, but I'll avoid the proprietary details here. Billy chimed over to the girl. Phil, have you seen Dark Star Orchestra? No, but I hear they're great. I saw them at the Keswick. If you close your eyes, they're almost better than the dead. Then some further chat about, did you have that tape or the other in copyright law? <laughs> Phil and I considered whether I should stop by to talk to Julie that night, but I decided to catch up the next day. We hadn't seen each other in seven years. Billy came over to say goodbye and handed me a brown bag. Here's a sandwich for the road. So maybe I should eat more often. <laughs> Thanks, Billy. I was touched. Billy walked me and Phil out, and I hugged Phil goodbye. I'll call you tomorrow then. Billy walked me around the corner to my car. Correction, my dad's car, whose auto unlock function I can't always get right the first time. It's really great to see your face, Billy. And it was. He, like me, loves to read, write, think, and not do much else. <sighs> Except sometimes beers and others a Shakespearean toke. <laughs> Keep up the good work, bud, and thanks again for the sandwich. I figured it was a Schmitter. How great would that taste when I got back up to my mom's? You got it, Ron. I turned the car around and pull up, pulled up to Germantown Avenue, took the quick right, left to the pike, and down. I don't remember what song was on, but rounding the cur curve at the wheel pump, I thought, I'm going to stop at Halligan's. I have to stop in Halligan's. It was not even 11.30. My parents wouldn't start to miss me until much later. The pub's lot was sparsely carred, <clears throat> excuse me, but there were a couple of people entering as I was, and I asked them, is it a private party? If it is, we weren't invited. Okay, if anyone asks, I'm with you guys. They met their friends at the bar, and I stood by and scanned the room for Joe Halligan. He wasn't behind the bar. I waited to see if he would come out of the kitchen, then decided to ask the bar back kid. Hi, I wondered if Joe's in tonight? Yeah, he's back in the dining room, and he gestured to the left. I peeked my head in the dining room, but Joe was talking to some people at the back table, so I walked back into the bar. Then he went right past and into the kitchen. I walked to the kitchen door, and when he came out, I said, Joe? Hi. I said, I'm Ronnie Norpel, and... I wanted to. And he said, oh, hi, Ronnie. Gosh, I haven't seen your brother's house, Joe, in so long. Tommy, I used to see your sister, Terry, a lot. She practically helped us open the place. Uh, we were in here a couple Thanksgiving ago, when she, uh, Thanksgivings ago when she and some other friends called an impromptu Springfield reunion. And I know you don't really know me, but I know you know my family, and I was just up the hill and heading back to my parents in Ambler. And, and he said, how's your mom? <laughs> She's fine, thanks. Anyway, I had to stop in just to say how sorry we are, all are and to let you know we're thinking of you all. Oh, thanks so much. We cannot be doing it without everybody's prayers. I just, I'm just so sorry. I mean, your mom drove our lacrosse bus and Michael was in my class. Oh, Mike's a great guy, he said of his own brother. I nodded. Never really haven't known Michael much, but having those mutual friends. I live in New York and everybody sent me emails right away. It sounds like Shane was a great kid. I have a 13-year-old son, and I just can't imagine. 
You don't think it's going to happen to you, to your family, you know? Joe says, I saw his mom today, and I think it's just starting to sink in, the permanence of it. Shane was such a great kid. He would never have done it if he had any idea what it would do to his mom. When you're a teenager, your vision is limited to your immediate world, and you can't see far enough ahead to know how many possibilities are out there in life. Like the Spectre Spook story, I can't detail more here, except to say Joe seemed grateful I stopped by, and I think I understand a little more about Shane, and I was glad to represent my family. Next day, I went, stopped by Phil's, spoke to Julie, watched Dallas lose to Detroit, sealing the Eagles division title, etc. Then I drove up 73 to my friend Wendy's house for the night. Back in New York, I unwrapped the package my Aunt Mimi had left for me at my mom's, a box of chocolates from America's oldest candy store, founded 1876, 110 Market Street, Philadelphia, PA, 19106, Shane's. <laughs> Wow. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Nice story.